Welcome to the Raising Smart Kids podcast. I'm your host, Yang Pratt, and each week we'll explore ways in which the arts can help you raise a smarter kid. I'll be sharing ways the arts can propel your child's learning and interviewing top artists, educators, and entrepreneurs. These guests will share why the arts are so very important to your child, along with actionable ideas you can easily implement into your already busy schedule. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast here on iTunes and share us with a friend. For extra tips on raising smart kids, head on over to artsmartparenting.com and click on the live tab. Well, welcome back to the podcast. Our special guest today is Catherine Kemp Guile. From kindergarten classrooms to corporate boardrooms, Catherine has inspired tens of thousands of individuals to improve their health, happiness, and productivity. Catherine is a speaker, certified nutrition counselor, and coach with a master's degree in business administration. She's the founder and executive director of Nurture, which provides nutrition and wellness education to children and adults. As a sought-after wellness and business expert, Catherine is often interviewed by leading media such as ABC, CBS, and NPR, and hosts her own radio show on wellness at KDPI-FM in Ketchum, Idaho. Catherine was named a 2016 Woman of the Year by the National Association of Professional Women. Catherine is also the award-winning and best-selling author of two books, Mountain Mantras, Wellness and Life Lessons from the Slopes, and Give It a Go, Eat a Rainbow, a children's picture book. Welcome to the show, Catherine. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this amazing show. Is there anything that I missed in your bio that you wanted to fill in our listeners on? I guess on a personal note, I think it's important for listeners to just picture a person that would go to a movie when her kids were in third and fifth grade. And the movie is The Race to Nowhere. And after watching that movie, deciding to pack up her, obviously, husband, who she adores, (laughs) pets and kids, and drive 1,500 miles west to get out of the rat race. So I guess that's something that the bio doesn't really cover is that, you know, we are now in Sun Valley, Idaho. We are making mountain living work. And it's just, um, I think it's so important, all the lessons that we learn from from taking risks, um, obviously mitigating the downside of the things that we're doing if we're taking risks, but then really learning from nature. So that's the only thing I would add that could never really be covered in a bio. And I think that le- those lessons you've learned certainly could be something that we discuss on a future episode because I think that's fascinating to be able to really uproot your entire family and go to a brand new location and make a, a new life for yourself. How exciting. Right. And I, and I want to inspire. I love being able to inspire others, not necessarily that they have to pick up and move, but you can do so much in your own head and heart and soul. I mean, right before we moved, I read this book by John Kabat-Zinn, and the book is titled, Wherever You Go, There You Are. And I believe that to be very true, that we can all transform within ourselves, even without making any location change. But we have to have this conscious decision that we want to live our highest version of our life. Yeah, the decision making and and making that switch internally to find the beauty and find the great things around you, no matter where you are, is certainly key to everything that we do in life. Absolutely. And if you're in a big city, you know, with people complain about smog or whatever, you can always find a patch of green. You can always touch the trunk of a tree or plant or leaf, look up at a a blue patch of sky or even a beautiful gray sky or whatever. But again, it's all about your mindset. I couldn't agree more. You know, we live in a small town and I often hear, gosh, when we go to the big city and do this and do that, and I sort of have to take a step back and say, wait, There's so many great opportunities here. And in the story that you were just telling us, you really brought up all these beautiful images of color. And we're really here to celebrate you today and the launch of your new book, 
about eating a rainbow. So take us back to the beginning of where that story started and how that book came, to, came into being. Absolutely. And it's a book truly that was written to a need. So over the last 10 years or so, I have been the acting executive director of Nurture, which is a nonprofit organization that provides nutrition and wellness education to children and families. And one of the most popular, amazing, high impact programs that we've been doing is called Rainbow Days. And it's fun because we do it in schools and sometimes in like health clubs or after school settings. We've done that in, you know, boys and girls clubs, YMCA's. But really what a rainbow day means is that you get kids excited about the rain. First of all, kids love rainbows, right? So they, you, you get them even more excited about what they already love, which is the, the rainbow. And then we talk about how Mother Earth provides a rainbow to us every day in the form of the foods that we eat. And so we would get the kids all excited about, we would usually assign, like if we're in a school, we assign each grade a color. So it's super cute. Everybody wears, like if you're the red team, you wear red and orange wears orange, yellow, and so on. So it's really cute. They all come to school and they're all feeling very involved and, the, and visually the setting is, is beautiful. And then we have lessons about the importance of eating fruits and vegetables and how it's so fun. We teach them about all the different uh, you know, vegetables and fruits that are in each color group. And then we always have some games, we have some fun, and then we have a snack bar or even at lunch, sometimes we can coordinate with the lunch school staff and we can, you know, have like a big salad bar that's rainbow based. And, and, I, and what I heard over and over and over from parents and from teachers was, oh my goodness, I can't believe how many fruits and vegetables these kids are eating. They're trying like it's this group setting. It's fun. There's no pressure. It's they get a little, you know, a little award at the end. There's stickers. It's, it's just this positive, you know, no pressure, no judgment, no like finish your plate kind of stuff. It's just fun. And, and they all want to be part of it. And so we saw this dramatic change in behavior and teachers started to see their kids bringing more healthy snacks and having healthier lunches and therefore doing better in school. Um, but what they said was, Catherine, it, only, it like wears off. Like human behavior, you know, we, we, if we're not constantly reinforcing something, we forget. And so they said, is there anything you could leave behind that's fun, that's engaging, that the kids will love that will remind them of what you're teaching them on rainbow day. So I looked around and I, I probably already owned every book out there about mm -hmm. the rainbow. And there are some good, more scientific ones. There's some really basic ones like, like board books for babies, but there wasn't anything that really told the story of transformation, which is that food is fuel. And if you're not eating good foods, you don't have energy and the way to get energy, which is what all kids want is to eat fruits and vegetables. And so because there didn't, there wasn't anything, there, it didn't exist, we decided to create the book. So it was created to fill that vacuum and to answer that question from parents and teachers, do you have anything? I wanted to be able to say, Yes, here you go. <laughs> yeah, and, and I love that. And I often find from people who run businesses and who are entrepreneurs, they're very keen at listening to the clues around them and finding that need like you did on um, teachers wanting to have a resource. So that's amazing. And I have to first of all say that this event sounds awesome. I just want to come and see the beautiful colors that are around and to have kids be excited because I find sometimes when they go off to school, that level of enthusiasm and energy isn't always present. And you're welcome. I mean, to come to any of our events or we'll come to you. In fact, that's one of our goals. Um, we actually are, we have a rainbow day coming up next week at a preschool, which is super cute and fun. And we just signed up um, events at some of our other schools around this area, but I've also traveled to other states to do rainbow days. And yeah, I mean, that's part of it is that we can actually go and it's fun for kids to see the illustrator because it is my son. And so it's a kid saying to other kids. So it's that peer to peer messaging, which is yes. so powerful. So that's it. That's what's, uh, there's an advantage to having us come because then it's like, oh my gosh, the author, but the illustrator who is a kid is here and telling me that, you know, the food gives 
him energy and it's really good for me. And so I'm going to follow what that kid is saying. So there's an advantage there. But for other schools that and I just talked to one um, outside of Boise the other day that said, I, I just would like the resources of how I can do it myself. And so we have on our website on giveitagoeaterainbow.com, we have all of the curricula that I would use um, as part of Nurture. We've got parent handouts in both English and Spanish, which is great so that you can send something home to the parents so that they understand what the kids learned about and they can re reinforce it at home. So we would love to see Rainbow Days just take off everywhere, across the nation, across the globe. <laughs> yeah, and I love that. So for our listeners, will you give them that website again? So if they're interested in bringing Rainbow Days to their school, what is the best way for them to do that? So uh, I would start with this website. It's Give It A Go eatarainbow.com. Thanks for asking me. I was probably just zoomed right through it. <laughs> um, so give it a go, eatarainbow.com. And right there, there's some, it's all free. It's all, all up there. And that's, you know, part of what our mission is, you know, as, as an author and illustrator team is, you know, we just want to help people. <laughs> and so we're happy to come to a school and do an event, to do a parent event or, or to do a school-wide event. But if the school wants to do it on their own, we have actual links to, again, these parent handouts and actually the curricula, which is, which is written out for the, it's almost like a script, like you would say to the kids and the, and the kids would answer. And it's this interactive uh, curricula that goes along with the book. And this is based on, again, my work with Nurture that I've been doing with tens of thousands of kids over the past decade or so. This is an amazing opportunity, too, because as you're telling me what this entails, you know, I would love to be able to see this in my own kids' school. They go to two different schools, and I can think of a couple of other preschools and other schools in town that would absolutely love this. So I will make sure that I head there, too, to grab those resources and find a way to get you here. Road trip. We would yeah, love it. So let's do it. <laughs> I want to talk about your 13-year-old son. Your son is the illustrator of this book. Can you talk a little bit more about what that was like to work with your son on this project and really what you hope that he's going to gain from this experience? Oh, it's such a great story. And, you know, I will tell you, middle school is a really hard time for most kids. I know I really had a hard time in, in middle school. And one of the best things that you can do for your children is to guide them to find their strengths. So we, he, was, he was struggling in middle school in terms of truly happiness factors. Like he just, he wasn't coming home from school. He's, he's down, like his, this core of him is this bright, smiley, happy, shining kid. And I was kind of seeing that, that light dim Mm -hmm. So as a parent, I said, okay, let's, let's figure out what's going on. And what we did is we started with a couple of fun assessments. We did what's um, something called a strength finder and any listener can just Google that it's free. Um, it's a strength finder and it's fun because what it does, and I took one for myself as well. It really tells you what you're good at and people love knowing, especially kids, teenagers, they love knowing what they're good at and that they are good at so many things. So we started there and we saw that he is really strong in these creative thinking, mm -hmm. inventing areas. And then I learned about this wonderful place called the Learning Success Institute and they actually do a more in-depth profile. For, and it's for kids. And we had him, we did this profile and, and I can actually send a link that you can put up. Uh, they were so nice to give us this discount code. So it's usually a $35 assessment and they gave me this discount, which was $5 off, which was great. And it's like forever, like anyone that uses the link gets that discount, but it's super cool because it's a fun test for kids. It, you know, kind of ask them how they like to learn, where they even ask things about colors and mm -hmm. um, like their attachment to, you know, like nature and pets. And then it gives you this beautiful report that tells you your learning modalities, how you learn best. And again, he came out really high on some of the things like inventing, curious, imaginative, creative, but he was pretty low 
relatively speaking, on some of those things that really create a good in-school student. And, and, and that's the producer. That's the organized kid that likes the work plans, the worksheets. Hmm. And my daughter's that, by the way, and she loves school. So you kind of have to get to know your kid. And that was a long way of me kind of just saying that it was a process of me as a parent really doing some important work to understand more about my child and what, how my child ticks, how mm -hmm. Alexander learns, what his strengths are. And then we kind of said, hey, you know, maybe this traditional school setting for eighth grade, which he would have been going into, isn't the right thing. And let's focus on your strengths. I mean, you know, we hear that from successful entrepreneurs and business people all the time. You, you work with your strengths and you find team members to help you with your weaknesses, but you don't just sit there and bang your head against the wall trying to fix your weaknesses, <laughs> right? You try though. <laughs> so, you know, we sent him to the Art Institute of Chicago. He did a full-time mm. program there. We're doing some things with the Learning Institute out in California. And we, he wanted to, to try out putting his, his work into the world. And I'm having him read, you know, big books, you know, like Stephen Covey and Elizabeth Gilbert and Jack Canfield. And, and, it's, and he's becoming more of an entrepreneur, but using his artwork that way. So our first step was, you know, gosh, I was talking about that vacuum I saw in the marketplace with teachers and parents wanting this book. I said, well, I could probably put together the wording, but I don't know how to do, uh, that's not my strength. I don't know how to do the art. So he said, well, why don't we do something really cool, which is fun and hot? And he picked this trend before it was really hot. So this was a, about a year and a half ago. He said, there's this thing where you can combine real life with illustration, and that's called augmented reality. Lo and behold, a year later, Pokemon Go was like this big hit. So he sort of was ahead of that curve. So we picked real fruits and vegetables and photos and backgrounds, which were so fun because for me as an educator, I need the kids to be exposed to the real thing. Like they need to actually see what a banana or a peach or an eggplant really looks like as opposed to the illustration. And then he worked with a really great creative team. He worked with an, his um, art teacher at school and a designer. And he worked on putting the, his illustrations together with the beautiful photos. And it just worked. I mean, it, it's won five awards. And we're talking about big awards like Mom's Choice, Parent Tested, Parent Approved, Academics Choice, Smart Book, like really exciting things. So he was, it was so great for him to have, you know, made, made that risk or taken that risk to put his work out there. And, and people are saying, this is great. And all these schools are saying, can you come and do a reading to us and do an art project with us? So it's, it's been fun. And, and the process of working with him and working on his strengths has just helped our relationship, mother and son, so much. Like we're having such a great time. <laughs> That's amazing. And I have to commend you because I know that there are parents out there who struggle with taking their kids to school because they realize that their strengths aren't being celebrated at school. And they're often told what their deficits are, but the, the strengths are kind of pushed aside. I love that you were able to, to notice and observe in your child and create a pathway for him to be able to use those gifts in a very positive manner. And I encourage all parents to really be thinking about that. There's this interesting phenomenon called the Losada effect by a scientist named Dr. Losada, and he talks about how the most effective teams work. And this applies to families. It applies to kids. But what he said is that the most effective teams have the most positive statements made. Mm -hmm. And for every one negative thing that you say, you need to say three things to neutralize it that are positive and you need to say six positive things to really get to you know where you're chugging along as a great team and then up to nine to eleven positive things just to that one negative to wow. really be, yeah so think about us as parents and how we go oh who left the, their shoes all dirty in the on the rug or whatever, that's a negative. And so already we've changed the energy in the room and in our relationship. So we need to immediately go to 
thank you so much for putting your dishes in the dishwasher. Thank you so much for making your bed. Like we as parents need to remember in our interactions how we need to be focusing on our kids' strengths because you know like a snowball, it's that effect. Like we want to get our kids to be happy growing snowballs as opposed to being stuck in a rut. And that is such, I've never heard of the Lasada effect, and I'll make sure that we put a link to that in our show notes, because I think this is exactly what parents need to hear. You know, we're here to talk about books and eating, and, but I think this particular topic is so timely and something that every parent should just grasp onto and say, okay, son or daughter, let's figure out your strengths and let's talk about the positive and let's frame the energy around you so when you leave and go into the world, you're prepared to tackle whatever comes at you. Amazing. Yeah. And it could be just an experiment. Like listeners can say, okay, for one day, I'm just going to focus on saying a lot of positive things to my spouse, to my kids, you know, to my friends, and then just see, see what happens. Just notice and decide if you want to continue. But what I notice is when I really focus on those positive yes. things, I see a lot more positive things happening. Absolutely. And we can all use more positivity in our lives. So you've told us about the awards that you've won for this book. Um, how has that impacted your son? And how has he responded to that feedback? He reads every Amazon review and he, they're, have, they're not always good. I mean, that's the thing. When you put your work out into the world and the more exposure it gets, obviously that, you know, you're going to see the good and the bad. So he's, I, it's been actually a really great lesson for him. When we do read a bad review, we talk about it and, and that's good because life isn't all roses and sunshine and whatever. Like, so he has enjoyed both reading the good and the bad, but I think what's, what he's most proud of is that the book hasn't just been ignored right? Like we, we, ha we have over a hundred reviews and these awards have been amazing and we haven't won every award, right? So again, we're, co we're constantly talking about how there, there's good and there's bad and we learn. Actually, when we read a bad review, we see why. And it's always kind of funny because like a couple of the bad reviews have been, they've been like hits on, on my rhyming. <laughs> and so I'm like, oh, it has nothing to do with you, Alexander. It's about me. <laughs> you know, so we have these, the, these great discussions around that, but he has, he really enjoys, um, kids don't like to be ignored, right? So he enjoys the attention and, and good and bad. Um, hopefully there's more good than bad, but the attention is great. And what it's really gotten him excited about doing is, is doing more work and getting more things out there. So right now we're working on, it's really actually, a, it's a difficult project, but we're working on getting the book into Spanish. So we're translating it. And that's going to be really fun. We're going to make it paperbacks. So we're going to have it be a lower price point and available to more families. So that's the next thing we're working on. And right on the tail of the Spanish version, we're working on version two or book number two in the series. And that's where our character Blake learns about plant identification and farm to school or sorry, farm to table. So it's not just about eating a rainbow like and getting away with eating Skittles and <laughs> Lucky Charms. Like Blake learns that, that rainbows are great, but like Blake starts out a little confused in the grocery store. Like there's a lot of colorful things here, but they don't make me feel good. And so somebody helped me figure out where a good rainbow comes from. And our new character is a bunny that takes Blake to the wow. farm and teaches Blake about you know, fruits and vegetables coming from plants, from trees, some grow above ground, some uh, below, below the ground. And it's kind of neat because I think a lot of kids might be able to identify a strawberry, but can they identify a strawberry plant? That's where we're going next. Well, and I, you mentioned something important too, that kids are very literal. So when you say eat a rainbow, they might be apt to grab the most colorful thing off the shelf and say, mommy, it's a rainbow. I'm eating a rainbow. So I love that book too is going to dive a little bit more deeply into, okay, there's some differences in different rainbows. So let's figure out what rainbow is going to help us be more healthy and grow. And it's so funny. It's about listening to your market. So we've been doing all these rainbow days and over the summer we were doing them at, you know, health clubs and community centers. And it was really funny because, you know, Alexander was there and he was doing his artwork with Blake and helping kids create their own Blakes. 
And there were a couple of kids that said, well, can I just eat Skittles or can I eat yeah. you know, Starbursts or whatever? So we were hearing that and we were going, oh no, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so Alexander and I kind of got together and we said, we need to follow up on this and make yes. it crystal clear. Again, you know, going to what the market was giving us as feedback, we need to make it crystal clear that the, the, the rainbow that gives us energy comes from plants. Yes. So let's dive right into the meat of the book and talk about the rainbow. Let's talk about the colors you use and maybe a couple of the attributes of each color that are going to help kids really develop and be sharper during the school day. Absolutely. It's so fun because the, it's all science-based. And when I would teach the Eat a Rainbow lesson in schools, I would just break it down into five groups. So I would use red, then I would have orange-yellow as my second group, Green is my third, blue purple would be together, and white, yes, there are a lot of really awesome white fruits and vegetables. We can talk about that. Um, but those were the five groups, and that was kind of a great way to keep things on track and keep it organized. So we use those same groups in the book, and what's so great about it is, so the journey is Blake goes from being low energy to high energy by going through this magical journey with his friend, the leprechaun that leads him to leads actually him or her. Cause Blake can, by the way, be either a boy or girl, which is kind of cool so that readers can identify with either gender. Uh, so the character goes through this journey and, and experiences magic in Blake's body based on the color. So when we talk about red foods, Scientifically, we're talking about things like lycopene that are really good for your cardiovascular system. Now, we're not talking about that in, bo in the book because it's for <laughs> kids, but what we do is we put the magic on, which is like in the, in like it's, it's like sparkles and the kids love that. They love actually finding the, the magic. Where is, wh what part of your body is this helping? And when we read the book to kids, I have them actually, like if we're talking about red, which is good for your heart. I'll have the kids put their hands over their heart. And so they kinetically remember red is good for my heart. And then we talk about how it's good for your brain because it's the same thing. It's good for your cardiovascular system. So red is good for your brain. So we touch our brains. Then we go into orange and yellow and we talk about how that's good for your vision. Vitamin A and then, and then there's vitamin C. It helps you from getting, um, from not getting sick and so, you know, we have the kids touch their eyes. So again, it's this like multi-sensory experience. We go into green, the kids love it because a lot of kids don't like eating green right. veggies. <laughs> and so I say, it's good for your teeth and bones. And then the kids are like, oh, like I don't like going to the dentist and getting a cavity. And so, you know, we point at our teeth and we talk about how we want to have strong bones and we want to, you know, when we were kids, it was all about Popeye, right? But like yes. the kids want to have strong bones. And so they get excited about that. And kinetically, they're thinking about their teeth and about their bones. Then when we get into blue and purple, I mean, scientifically, we're talking about um, antioxidants. Oh, and by the way, the green, it's because those foods are very high in calcium. So that's why it's good for your, for your um, teeth and bones. Blue and purple, high in antioxidants. Don't want to talk to kids about cancer. Don't want to talk to about kids about aging. So what we do is we talk about just overall energy and speed. And there's a picture where Blake's running really fast through a, a field of blueberries and kids love that picture. So that's the blue and purple. And our final color is white. And, you know, white, are, you know, that's things like cauliflower, turnips, radishes, you know, potatoes. There's a lot of really great. And on the inside, too, of a lot of fruits and vegetables are white, like even apples and pears and things are white on the inside, parsnips. And th those all have a lot of fiber. So I always have the kids rub their tummy. And I say, you know, white is really good for your tummy. And they love that. And it's funny because... We have done this, again, with so many groups. And the designer that worked with Alexander, she came in and visited to see how the book was going with the kids. And we did a bunch of beta testing. And she came a little bit late, and we had already read the book, and we had already done our game. We had already done our art project. And then she showed up. And so it had been maybe 40 minutes since we read the book. And I just wanted to test right in front of the designer. I looked at the kids, and I said, what is white good for? Can you show me? And all these, these were, they were kindergartners. They were so cute. They all just grabbed their tummy and started rubbing it. 
And it made the designer's day. Her name is Colleen. And she was just like, wow, this project is making such an impact. So it's, it's just really fun to make it multi-sensory. It's based on science, but we're not putting the science in the kids' faces. We're making it fun. Well, you're making it accessible too, because there, there are some parents out there too that maybe were not raised in a household where the rainbow was part of the, their vocabulary. So for them to be able to walk into a situation where they're also learning along with their kids and then seeing that magic happen where they can relate what they just learned to how it's going to affect their health. And kids are great at remembering things. If I forget something, my kids will say, oh, mom, it's this. So if we're able to simplify nutrition in a way that kids are able to understand, it's relatable, and they really get what's going to be helping them, that's obviously a step in the right direction, and we need more kids and more parents being able to access these programs that you're offering because it really does impact not only their health, but their ability to do well in school. And it just has to be simple. I mean, that's the thing. It's like, you know, if you get, if there's a curricula for school that, or a, a curriculum or a set of curricula for schools that is very complex, that gets too much into the science, then the kids really aren't going to take it away into their everyday lives. What I learned for my first book, the Mountain Mantras book, I interviewed a lot of Olympians. And I, and I went around and I tried to figure out what their magic elixir was. Like, what's the thing that they're doing or eating that's making them such high performing human beings. And I thought it was going to be this like superfood, this powder mixed with wobble, you know, <laughs> but you know what they told me, they said, we compete when we go out to dinner. Cause they're always traveling and they're always as a team. We compete to get who gets the most colors from <laughs> mother nature on their plate. So it's as simple as that. It's the Olympians are eating a rainbow and and it's like, I thought it was going to be this com complicated thing, but it's not. So the wonderful thing is that we can all do that. We can all eat like Olympians. Mm -hmm. well, that's amazing. And earlier you talked about the color green and how most kids kind of shy away from the broccoli and the kale, the things that are really making their teeth and bones strong. You've been called the picky eater whisperer. How can parents take some simple ideas to get their kids to eat more colors, especially those green ones. Okay, so here's a great first tip. I mean, in overall, the umbrella advice is to keep it positive, never force food on kids, never say you have to finish your plate, don't make any, um, it, just take away any tension. I've worked with a lot of families where the first thing I needed to do with them to help them was just to take the tension out of it. So that's the first thing. And, and that's more of like a big umbrella statement. But um, here's a couple. I'll just give you two like really high impact things. The first thing is, and again, this doesn't involve any money or, or buying the book, but if you go to giveitagoeaterainbow.com, you can download Blake. And what we tried to do is create this phenomenon that was similar to that flat Stanley thing where the kids had their own flat Stanley and some would like put it on a popsicle stick and it was like their own flat Stanley. And, and Blake, the Blake that's downloadable, that's free is black and white. So, so some girls add more hair and then put a little skirt on Blake and Blake's they're a girl and the boys, you know, they do all kinds of things, right. That, you know, to make it something like that they can identify with. So you want the kids to identify with some kind of like hero or mentor and Blake is the mentor or hero that has lots of energy. Okay. And then you have them bring, just like Flat Stanley was all about getting kids excited about travel and adventure, what Blake does is Blake gets kids excited about eating healthy. And so it's not mom and dad anymore. It's Blake that's coming to snack time, that's coming to dinner time. And Blake loves eating green and you know red and blue and purple and white and the more the better. And so you have Blake along and what it does, that helps to diffuse the parent-child tension, especially with little kids. And, and then it makes, it just kind of creates this objective outside support team in the form of Blake that like, do you think Blake would like this? And it works. And I have heard from so many parents that said, you know, my kids would never try this, that, that, that. But now that they have Blake, 
they'll try it. They don't always love it, but at least they'll try it. So that's one thing is, is to, while you're diffusing the tension, maybe take yourself as the, as the parent out of the equation and get some other resource. And sometimes it's hard to have like a, somebody like me who could visit the school and, 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 and be the non-parent, um, you know, instigator, but you can do it in the form of a fun little character that they can identify with, that they can create, that's going to, to be inspiring them to try new foods. That's my first big tip. And then the second one is just to give them choice and involvement. So when you're shopping, when you're, um, when you're planning your meals, when any, if you're, if you want to grow a garden, what, 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 what seeds are we going to choose? Any, any time that you can educate, inspire, and really give choice, that's going to be where you're going to solve the picky eater issues. Awesome. Choice is key. And I love that Blake is this third party now that can come in and be the mediator, if you will. It's kind of like when kids come to us and they come for dance or music lessons and the kids listen to us, the teachers, a little bit differently than they listen to mom and dad. So they have that third party in this little guy or girl who can travel in a lunchbox, who can go with them on the playground. I think that's brilliant to really get the kids interested in what it is they're feeding their bodies. And it's also fun because it's art, right? And so kids love to draw and they can cut out their own Blakes. And you're right, Blake can travel. So it's, it's, we also have this community. It's hashtag Blake eats a rainbow. And so kids, because I do think kids, like you said, they're going to listen to people that are not their parents in a different way, but they're going to listen to peers. They're going to listen to kids. So we have this uh, community. It's at the bottom of the page of give it a go, eat a rainbow.com. It's a tag board. So anybody that is, you know, that has Blake and you have this beautiful, you know, salad or arrangement of, you know, colorful fruits and vegetables, you put Blake right next to that, take a picture Add the hashtag on any social media platform, Blake Eats a Rainbow, and then that feeds onto that page. And so what kids can do with their parents is is you can go to the website, scroll to the bottom and go, look at how many kids, look at what they're choosing. And actually what I love seeing is kids will actually create these beautiful actual rainbows on their plate, you know, so they have the red peppers, you know, all in an arc and then they have like mandarin oranges below it. And then they think of these cool things like putting cauliflower clouds at the ends. So this, this little like tag board at the bottom of our website can be inspiration that is coming from other people and other kids that will allow the parents to just remove themselves a little bit. (laughs) Yeah, that's really such a great tip. And I know for us, we have this great book at home and the the name escapes me right now, but it's a book all about how fruits and vegetables can move through the world. You know, there's there's somebody sailing, but the sails are made of vegetables and the person on the boat is a banana. And so I think Blake is very similar to this where it's giving – a character, if you will, is bringing the story into their lives that they can identify with. And I think that's just, again, just a brilliant thing. Yeah. Again, identification with other kids or just a character. That's why simple drawings by, again, my son, I just love that. And he knew this. He said, kids identify more with simple illustrations as opposed to really complex illustrations. Think of like Charlie Brown from our childhood. Very, very simple, but we loved Charlie Brown and all of Charlie Brown's friends. And so if, if you get too complex with the illustrations, it becomes harder for a small child to be able to step into that character's shoes. Yes. And so um, it's, it's fun that Blake is so adaptable and is, is, is really simple but effective. Well, and the fact that he had the insight at 13 to know that simple is better, I mean, that just to me blows my mind because as adults, I think we all still struggle with, we have to make it more complex because it's going to be perceived as being a better thing when really, if we just dial it down and keep it simple, with nutrition or anything in our lives, it makes it much easier and accessible. Kids are some of our best teachers for sure. (laughs) Yes. And, you know, with having this rainbow discussion about the food, I think that's lovely too, because on this show, we talk all about how parents can incorporate the arts. And I think that food as art is such an interesting topic. 
Can you talk a little bit about how maybe food or nutrition is like art? Oh my gosh, yes. It's so exciting. In fact, there is a lesson that I teach called edible art. Yeah. And I mean, there are books. I wish I had one right here and I would hand it up and show show you or I'll, I'll, I'll send you the link. But there are the most beautiful. In fact, what I'll do after the, after the interview, I'll send you a picture that somebody recently sent me of an owl and the feathers were all thinly sliced cucumbers. So the wow. inside and just oh, like this just beautiful, colorful, gorgeous owl made out of veggies. You know, there was um, baby carrots involved and I think there was like little olives for eyes. So I have seen over and over and over and over the most creative, beautiful art yes. made out of food. So, I mean, oh my gosh, here's a tip for parents. Let your kids play with their yeah, food. Absolutely. <laughs> You know they can they can play, they can create characters on their plate. You can make like a little, um, you know, stick man or stick woman by you know taking a celery stick and you know take a turkey roll and make a cucumber you know slice into a head. You can do all kinds of things that makes their lunches more fun. They open it up and there's like a little celery guy in there with like a turkey head and you know maybe some cream cheese or peanut butter on the celery to make it you know like to balance the meal out. A couple of um, little raisins there, you know, like buttons, you know, you can, you can do so much with food and art. It's, there's that. And actually, I love this. I went to this workshop at a greenhouse recently and they were taking broccoli, like raw broccoli and all other kinds of, cause, cause food is beautiful. I mean, if you look at, like inside of a cut open a red purple cabbage, it's like, Oh, beautiful. You know, cauliflower is beautiful but they would take it and they would dip it into paints and you use the, the vegetables as the way to make art. And, and what we're really trying to do there is we're trying to expose the kids in a fun way to these foods because the, the more that the kids see fresh fruits and vegetables, the less afraid they will be when they're they land on their plate. <laughs> yeah, and really just making it fun, making it not scary, simplifying it, like you said, kids can relate to those things. And so I think for any kid, if they were able to go and paint with broccoli or they got a banana and got to squish it out and make a collage and stick things to it, that simple act of just playing with your food, like you said, is going to go such a long way in really encouraging and inspiring them to not only play with their food, but to taste it as well. And, you know, art is really about, you know, appreciating things with your senses. Yeah. And I think that that's another thing that parents can do with, with food is when they sit down at the table, rather than saying, eat your kale, what they can say is, look at this, this kale. Like, is it bumpy? Is it, um, is it crumbly? Like, and look at this fruit. Like, is it juicy? Yeah. Do you think it's sweet? I mean, start to use... Uh, you know, give your kids credit of using bigger adjectives, but start like really looking visually smelling. If the kids don't want to smell or they don't want to actually taste it, start with smell. It's really, yes. it's the whole experience. It's seeing, it's smelling, it's then tasting and touching obviously, and then using adjectives all along the way to become more familiar in yeah. a very neutral and hopefully positive way. Absolutely. And just having the access to some of these fruits and vegetables I know sometimes is um, a challenge. I think one of my daughter told me recently that somebody came in to talk about some foods and they brought these different vegetables and most kids were not able to tell them what an eggplant was or what a turnip was. And to me, that's fascinating because I grew up in a household where we never talked about nutrition in this sense as far as eating colors. It just was. My mother is Korean, so... She comes from a background where it's all fruits and vegetables and it just happens at every meal. And I know there are some families whose backgrounds are different. So again, making food fun, making it simple and making it accessible where they can use all their senses. Gosh, I mean, that is such a great, simple thing people can do after they get off this, from listening to this interview. They can go do it today. 
you know, absolutely. And make it a, you can make it a scavenger hunt. Like you can go to a farmer's market or a store and you can say, can you find me something purple for, for dinner tonight? And kids love jobs. They love to be, you know, to, to have some power to make a decision. So yeah, kids really need, I've, I've read in the scientific literature, it's between seven and 16 times of exposure before they really become comfortable with something. So don't be discouraged listeners out there. Don't be discouraged if for the first one, two, three, four, five, six times, you know, it's, you know, we're, 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 you're seeing a, you know, kind of, you know, response to these, these vegetables, just keep going, be patient, keep yourself neutral, hopefully positive. And, um, I do like to say to kids though, that, that, it, that we don't say things or we don't use bad negative words or to the foods. Like we don't say this is yucky or gross, especially in a setting with other kids, because that's just not good manners. If we don't like something, we don't say anything at all. You know, we neutral or positive. Yes. And I think as parents, that can sometimes be a challenge too, as we're trying to introduce something to our kids that we may not like having to keep control of our facial expressions or our body language is really going to be critical in getting our kids to take that next step to try something new. Yeah. So parents, when you take your kids to the grocery store, make sure you yourself have had a couple of, you know, like an apple or a healthy snack or a handful of almonds or something so that you're not cranky. Yes. Because <laughs> you want to be able to, to have that neutral or positive attitude. Absolutely. So I think all of listeners should really go out and grab a copy of this book. What is the best place for them to find out more about the book and where can they purchase that? The easiest way really is Amazon. So just go to Amazon and type in, give it a go, eat a rainbow. It's available as a hardback and it's available as a a ebook. Um, If people are interested in buying it in bulk, like for a book club or for um, a school, we can offer really amazing discounts for groups. Yeah. So that would be at give it a go, eat a rainbow.com. And there's a way to contact our team and publisher. And in, in a group setting, we can, you know, we're happy because we really just want to get this book out there. We're happy to offer great discounts and, and get it into as many hands as we can. Thank you so much for that information, because I think really this is such a great book, such an easy read, and it's understandable on all levels from all, from everyone from parent to kids. So I think everybody go out and check out this book. And before we say our goodbyes, I know that you have something special that you've planned for our listeners. Can you tell us a little bit more about your challenge? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I created a, well, it's a, it's actually something that I did with nurture and it is a cookbook and it is free and the listeners can go to this website link. It's called katherineguile.com. Yeah. You have to put the www, but www.katherineguile.com backslash nutrition tips. And when you go there, you just have to say, yes, I want the cookbook. And it's this really fun, colorful cookbook that is really meant for kids. And there's little tips on how to involve your kids. And it's things that are, are so simple. They're all healthy. And it's simple stuff that your kids can make with you. Because again, I, I mentioned educate, inspire, and give choice. So yeah. having a cookbook that is really like a kid-friendly for the kids have them choose a recipe to make and they're all super simple. So it's not going to be a million trips to the store and a huge mess in your kitchen. It'll be fun and a great place to start. That's amazing. I will make sure that I put that direct link. So listeners head over to the link on our show notes page and you can grab a copy of this amazing cookbook and get started with eating better and eating a rainbow with your kids. Well, I've had such a blast interviewing and talking to you today and I know we could talk for much longer but I know you're you're on your way to do more things with your kiddo so can you leave our listeners with one final piece of advice on eating a rainbow on eating a rainbow again just keep it positive keep it fun and the minute you feel any tension coming into the discussion or into the environment take a deep breath 
Sometimes I need to leave the room. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but the positivity it, it, or at the very least neutrality will go a long way in avoiding eating disorders. But, it, but you know, on the, on the positive side, creating a healthy eater that knows that food is fuel. I love that. Okay, so you heard it here first. Food is fuel. Well, Catherine, I've had such a great time with you today. I want to thank you for your generosity, and I look forward to connecting with you in person very soon. I'm so excited, and thank you for what you're doing and your amazing show and all the help that you're giving people. So keep it up, and yes, we will see each other soon. Awesome. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you too. Bye-bye. Thanks for tuning in to the Raising Smart Kids podcast. If you're enjoying this podcast, please share us with a friend and head on over to iTunes and leave us a review there and let us know you're enjoying the show. If you're looking for more tips on raising smart kids, head to Amazon.com and pick up a copy of my first book, Raising a Superhero, How to Unleash Your Child's Eight Superpowers and Propel Learning Through the Arts. Thanks for allowing me to be your guide on this parenting adventure, and I look forward to catching you next time.